וואו, שבוע טוב, הגות אבוך, שבוע טוב ומבורך to one and all, what an incredible event and grand final, I'm not sure if this is my 10th or 20th lecture over the last, I don't know, 24 hours. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, this fellow is sitting in the lounge in the airport, sipping a nice coffee, reading a newspaper, and he sees a profile of a woman who was actually dressed as a flight attendant, and she's making herself a cup of tea. And he takes a quick look or glance, and he likes what he sees. So he wants to, you know, kindle some type of uh, connection, ignite some type of conversation. But he decides he'll do it in a classy way. After all, he's a sophisticated Jew. He likes to do things classy style and fashion. He's not just going to want to say, he's not going to tell her, you want to talk to me? No. <laughs> so he decides to actually use the motto of the airlines, the slogans of the airlines, trying to guess which airline she works for. So first he assumes she's probably united. So he turns to her and he's like, Fly the friendly skies of United. She takes a look and gives him a really dirty look. So he thinks to himself, okay, it must be American. We know why you fly. We're American Airlines. Another dirty look. He thinks she must be JetBlue. He's like, comfort first. Another really dirty look. It's like, okay, Delta. We aim higher. She turns around. She says, do you know you're a sick man? You're insane. You're crazy. You're obnoxious. You're rude. You're repulsive. You're abominable. And you're disgusting. He says, ah, El Al. <laughs> it's just a joke, relax. We are known as an argumentative people. Three Jews, 19 opinions, is not a cliche. In Hebrew, our greetings attest to the fact that we love a fight. You greet a Jew, you say, Shalom Aleichem. His response is, Aleichem Shalom. Exact opposite. Imagine in English, good evening, evening good. <laughs> how are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? So the guy is nuts. But in Hebrew, we do it all the time. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. Why not Shalom Aleichem? Shalom Aleichem. Answer, because when two Jews meet, even as they greet each other, they have to disagree. Shalom Aleichem, nah, you got it all wrong. It's exactly the other way around. Now that we established that we know how to argue, now maybe we can have a peaceful conversation. There's a fellow, you may have heard of him, a great Kabbalist. His name is uh, Jackie Mason. Uh, he's the guy who repeats most of my jokes. So he once said, 
He once told me, he says, when two Jews meet, if within three minutes they don't establish a family relationship, one of them is not Jewish. <laughs> Your mother-in-law's first cousin is somehow connected to me, but there's a relationship. But I would add, if two Jews meet, if within a few minutes they're not disagreeing, one of them probably is not Jewish and needs to convert. Which, of course, becomes so much more emphatic when you move in with another Jew. You move in. And by the way, I once asked a young Jewish fellow, Rabbi Kiva spoke about intermarriage a lot. I said, why do you want to marry out? He says, I don't want somebody to always argue with me. <laughs> I just want somebody to agree. That's why a lot of these Jewish guys, they love these Korean women, Japanese women, you know? Yeah. They don't know about mink coats. They don't know about going out to a restaurant every night. And they think their husbands are close to God. And it's like, he told me, you know, with a Jewish wife, it's like the question, do you have a right to exist? It's like, forget about God. Uh, somebody once asked Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz at a dinner in Manhattan, if Mashiach is gonna be a man or a woman. He said, a man. She said, that's horrible, that's male chauvinistic. Why can Mashiach be a woman? And his response was, you know, women today control everything. There's still one thing that men have, Mashiach. <laughs> <laughs> Do you gotta take that away from them? <laughs> Just let them ha hold on to that, to that one little thing that Mashiach is gonna be a guy. Come on. So, in the culture of, of argument, Marriages often experience stress and duress. So here's a little Jewish trivia. You know, Emmet is about education. So let's do a little Jewish trivia, okay? And whoever knows the answer gets an extra. I'm not going to tell you what. Where is the first time the word love, the word love, ahava, is mentioned in the Torah? The first time love is mentioned. Somebody loves somebody else. Avram and Sarah, you would think so, but it doesn't say anywhere that Ab I'm sure Abraham and Sarah loved each other. It doesn't say it. That's the sixth time. Rachel and Yaakov, good answer, but you're going to number six. I'm looking for number one. Yitzchak to Rivka is number two. I'm looking for number one. Very good, very good. Extra sushi for him. <laughs> and frozen yogurt for her. <laughs> the first time, friends, is Parshat Vayera. We say it in the morning before the davening. The story of the binding of Isaac. Shem tells Abraham, God tells Abraham, Kachna et bincha et yechidcha, asher ahafta. Take your son, your only son, the one you love. It's the first time love is mentioned in the Torah. God testifies that Abraham loves Isaac. Abraham loves Yitzchak. It doesn't even tell the story that Abraham loves Yitzchak. It's Hashem telling Abraham, take the son whom you love. So the first love is from father to son, Abraham to Yitzchak. Now be with me. When is the second time love is mentioned? Very good. Yitzchak to Rivka. You get it? You see what's happening? Who is the first one who is loved? Yitzchak. Who is the first one who loves? Yitzchak. Avraham loves Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the first recipient of love. And then he goes ahead and he loves his wife, Rivka, that's the second love. What's the third time love is mentioned? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Rivka loves her son Yaakov, as Yitzchak loves his son Esau. And then you move on, and Yaakov loves his wife, Rachel. So you see, he who is loved is capable of loving. Yitzchak is loved, he can
can love Rivka. Rivka is loved, she can love her child. Her child is loved, he can love his wife. He or she who is loved is capable of loving others. But what if you're not loved? It's hard to love others. You don't know what it is. And here is one of the greatest issues that so many couples have. And it reminds me of that anecdote. There was this fellow. He was a real, he was a real not Bukharian type of character. Okay? I'm not going to tell you what he was, but he wouldn't fit into the culture. Over Shabbos, I fit in not badly, but he would not fit into the culture. I'm not converting, but I fit in not badly. Georgia, not too far. Uzbekistan, I come from Georgia. Kutais, Kutais and, 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 and Bukhara and Georgia, not too far, but boundaries. <laughs> Which couples need to. So this fellow, you know, on planes, there's aisles, windows. He calls up the airline. He's flying on Swiss Air. And he wants to fly, and he arranges for himself an aisle seat. An aisle for him is very, very important. And he was a Swiss fellow, too. A week before, he calls up again to confirm he has an aisle seat. Yes. A day before, he calls up again. Yes. An hour before he leaves the airport, he calls up again to confirm he has an aisle seat. Imagine the horror when he gets onto the airplane. He comes to his seat and he has a window seat. He is furious, furious. He lands in New York, calls his wife and says, I am going to sue them, those lowlifes. I booked the ticket six months ago, aisle seat. I confirmed two weeks ago, a week ago, a day ago, this morning. Aisle, aisle, aisle. In reality, they gave me a window, those low-life sick people. His wife says, darling, why didn't you just ask the person in the aisle to change with you? He says, because that seat was empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people exactly live that way, but it's exactly what happens in so many marriages. Your wife tells you something, okay, you get offended, you're upset, you're angry, you're nervous, you're frustrated, you're annoyed, you develop all these anger issues. It has nothing to do with what she said. It has to do with the fact that you have internal trauma, you have internal pain, you have an internal prison in which you live. And everything she says, you're filtering through your own prism, which happens to be a prison. Everything she says, you're taking, not everything, but many things, you're taking the wrong way, simply because you're hearing what you're capable of hearing based on your own past experiences. She is triggering emotions in you that have nothing to do with what she is saying or feeling. They have to do with the fact that you were never loved. And therefore it's hard for you to believe that somebody loves you. And therefore when your wife tells you something, especially if it's criticism and if she's a Jewish wife, she's doing that. <laughs> what you're hearing is not I love you so much, I cherish you, you're the best of the best, but I want to share my feelings with you. What you're hearing is, somebody is mixing into my life, somebody's judging me, somebody doesn't like me, somebody wants to repress me, somebody is jealous of me, somebody can't deal with me. And conversely, sometimes, when you're speaking to your wife, and she is triggered. The greatest gifts we can give ourselves as couples is to be able to identify those triggers to be able to say, whoops, I'm triggered, and it has nothing to do with you, it got to do with me. When a couple can start having that conversation, you have just triggered me because of my fears, my pain, my insecurity, my past, my trauma, my luggage, my proclivities, my instincts, 
my baggage, or you have been triggered because of your baggage, instead of arguing whose baggage is greater, when you could take responsibility for your emotional responses, that's when your insecurities become a catalyst and a springboard and a pedestal for deeper love, for deeper relationships. Because that which should separate you actually now brings you closer. Because when you can tell your spouse your vulnerabilities and speak about these fears and these insecurities, that's what makes a relationship very powerful because it connects you in your weakest, weak, weakest link. Yitzchak could love fully because he was loved. Rivka can love fully because she was loved. And those of us who never felt the taste of love, how many of you experienced in your life real love, unconditional love? You don't have to all raise your hands simultaneously. <laughs> but those who did not, you don't know what it really means. You don't know how to receive it. You don't know how to give it. You don't even know how to accept it. And you manipulate it in your own mind. And you know what you gotta do? We gotta work very hard on ourselves to discover the love that we have to ourselves and the love that Hashem has to us. Ahavat olam ahavtanu. Or as King David says, my father and mother abandoned me and Hashem took me in. Ki avi ve'imi azavuni v'ashem yasveini. Now it's a very interesting thing because marriages in America are not growing, they're decreasing. The divorce rate accelerates. Fights and fragmentations in homes are very, very powerful. And people often ask me, if Yiddishkeit, if Judaism, if tradition stops divorce and creates happy marriages. And the answer is no. <laughs> Religion, Judaism, they don't create happy marriages. It's people who work on themselves who create happy marriages. However, Judaism creates a lifestyle that is conducive for people who want to have a good marriage to be able to have a good marriage. There are people who keep Shabbat and do all the mitzvahs and they have horrible marriages. You know why? Because they're babies. They're immature babies and they're not ready to deal with their demons and skeletons. So it's not like if you keep Shabbat and you put on tefillin and you go to shul for Mincha Mayriv, suddenly miracles, your marriage becomes a beautiful marriage. It's not true. Some Jews are running away to shul because they don't want to be home. It's a great excuse. Mincha, Mincha, Mayriv, Dafyoimi, Eloif. Where are you going? Work out the issues. Religion, religion can become an excuse for everything. That's the fact. If you're not a mensch, you know what a mensch is? Let me say a mensch in Bukharian. Okay, I, I, it wasn't for me, it was for you. I don't care how religious you are. If you're not a mensch, nothing is going to help. You know why? God will become part of your abuse. God will become part of your dysfunction. We have to work on ourselves. You have to refine your ego. I have to challenge my demons, skeletons, trauma, fears. That's what Judaism is. That's what Torah is. I have to make a puncture in my fears, my insecurity. I have to feel wholesome. And then the lifestyle of Judaism becomes conducive for a couple that wants to grow. And when somebody can live that way, then even today in 2019, you can have a beautiful, stunning, amazing, romantic, affectionate, incredible, real Bukharian marriage. <laughs> And you know, my friends, and the fact remains, and the fact remains that so much of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, is built around the structures. It creates the structures that allow for relationships, for communication. Take the miracle of Shabbos. The miracle of Shabbos when he can't use his iPhone for 24 hours. The miracle, the miracle of Yiddishkeit that allows people to sit with themselves, to be introspective, to spend time on focusing on higher values. The miracle of mikveh, which allows space in a marriage. I was speaking in San Francisco 
about mikvah, about uh, relationships. Interesting. And uh, so they asked me, what's this strange thing that Jews do, you know? So I said this, there are two types of marriages. There's a fire marriage and there's a water marriage. The difference is this. You could raise your hand when I describe yours. Fire marriage is fire, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy. But when you get into a fight, oh my God. It's explosive on every level. And then there's a water marriage. Costco, I call it a Costco marriage. Well, it's calm, it's like, yeah. It flows like a nice river, a lake, lake, you know. No major explosions in the positive or the negative. It's like a friend, you know, an old, it's like a business friend. Every couple I know wants both. Every couple I know, you want fire, passion. You also want water, calm, relaxed. There's one problem. Nobody in history ever invented a method to bring together fire and water. If there's fire, there's no water. If there's water, there's no fire. What do you do? Came the Torah three and a half thousand years ago, and God said, I'll tell you how to do it. Two weeks, fire. Two weeks, water. Two weeks, fire. Two weeks, water. Two weeks, I want to see the fire. Ooh. Think Iran is going nuclear? <laughs> but two weeks, I want the water. Got to learn to talk, to communicate, to share what's going on. Boundaries, space. Kotzke Rebbe said, I bich ben nich, weil du bist du, und du bist du, weil ich ben nich, ben ich nicht dich, und du bist nicht du. Translation of Bukharian. I mean in English. If I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you, then I am I and you are you. And now we can begin to schmooze. I am I and you are you. Space, boundaries. Respect, fire and water. This recipe of Yiddishkeit three and a half thousand years ago is still working wonders. It's still allowing every Jewish couple that follows it to remain fresh, vibrant, alive. It allows men to learn boundaries. It allows women to feel self-respect. And it allows a couple to be able to grow with that healthy balance of closeness and distinctiveness. We're one and we're also distinct people. Always bless grooms and brides. I tell them, you're like a letter in this, your letters in the Torah. I want to bless you that your two letters should be close enough that we should see that you're part of one word. But it shouldn't be so close that the two letters touch each other and there's no space around the letter which disqualifies a Torah. Every letter has to have space around it from all sides. It should be close enough to be able to see your one word, but not so close that the two letters eclipse each other and one doesn't see that there is separateness. And here we are tonight celebrating the incredible success of this Jewish organization, Emmet, which Mamish watches every week, another Jewish couple getting formed, another engagement, another wedding happening, every single week. Incredible. And that's a special celebration, and many of you sitting here tonight are products of that miracle and of that blessing of the power of Jewish family, the power of Jewish marriages, the power of Jewish continuity that happens only when we have the courage to step out of our own lives and to join with somebody else. 
to build a family and life together with all the challenges, but it's those challenges that allow for the miracle of Jewish continuity, which has always become the most important focus in Jewish life. People always ask, why are Jews still here? And the answer is because we always remained young. Why did we always remain young? Because our focus was always the young, the children. A nation that focuses on the young remains young. And that's the reason why you only ask a question. Where is Pharaoh? Where is Nebuchadnezzar? Where is Titus? Where is Haman? Where is Stalin? Where is Caliglia? Where is Pompey? Where is Titus? Where are they? Where is Hitler, Rosenberg, Himmler, Eichmann? Where are they? Where is Arafat? And the answer is they are in Wikipedia. <laughs> we are the Jews. And the answer is we created Wikipedia. <laughs> Together with Google, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you want, and if you want, you can take out your phone as I speak. I don't mind you doing it anyway. <laughs> and you can edit Pharaoh, Haman, Antiochus. You can edit them in Wikipedia. We write the obituaries of our enemies and we edit them. But we don't only want to write their obituaries and edit them. We also want them to increase our survival. And that's why we turn them into food. <laughs> so we took Haman. And we turn them into a hamantash. We want Haman not only to die, we want him to feed us. We want him to increase our fat reserve. We want to become fat and obese and blame Haman. It's not my fault, it's Haman's fault. He's always wanted to destroy me. Then it was through death, now it's through obesity. Hamantash, carbs, sugars. Purim is coming. We took Antiochus and we turned him into a latke. We took Pharaoh and we turned him into a matzo ball. That's what we believe in. Let them increase our cholesterol. Let them make us big and fat and strong. I was asked on Hanukkah why we eat so many latkes and donuts. And I said, because Hanukkah represents our victory over the Greeks. The Greeks were into four things. Looks, sports, athletics and exercise that's why at Hanukkah we eat endless donuts and latkes to make sure that we will never look like them <clears throat> I didn't know how right I was till I had Bukharian food this Shabbos so this is how it worked this is how it works I grew up in a home two courses three courses Four courses is already beyond. Okay, I came very hungry to Queens. I was starving, yeah? They served the first course. I mamish finished it completely. I left nothing. I was starving. Second course, I still had place. I always make place for the second course. Third course, I always make place for the third course too. By the time the third course was over, I expected this is it. We're going to go bench. Welcome to Bukhari and Shabbos meal. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> I thought Friday night, Shabbos day, nah, it was even worse. Shabbos day, like 16 courses. And the 16th course is like better than everything else. This is quite an interesting culture. I'm now considering conversion. <laughs> I thought latkes and donuts were good. Nebach. <laughs> you know how Ashkenazim entertain themselves? That's not where you go for entertainment. They're traumatized. Yeah, they grew up with Christians in Europe. They're traumatized with guilt and confessions. That's what they do. They make a fist and they say, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Ghazalnu, Dabarnu, Daifin. They're not even ready to eat rice on Pesach. No sushi on Pesach. That's it. I'm going back to my Sephardic roots. I don't like the slichus and elul. I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, I guess there's trade-offs. So my dear friends, we don't only want to edit them. We want to eat them. We want to consume them. We want them to become part of our identity. 
But the truth is, if you look around this room, you'll see one of the greatest miracles of Jewish survival. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Many of you, you or your parents or your grandparents, come from a certain part of the world, which you know very, very well about. And a few summers ago, two summers ago, I went to visit the former Soviet Union, which of course included all of the 11 branches of the former USSR. And I experienced this incredible feeling. The incredible feeling was exactly this. <laughs> it's Hanukkah, and there's a menorah in the Kremlin. And there's two, three thousand people observing the kindling of the menorah by the rabbi singing Mo's Tzur Yeshua Ti, lighting the menorah, a few yards away from the mausoleum where they lay the two corpses of Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin. And I'm thinking to myself how they must be turning over, I'm not going to say in their graves, but how they must be turning over in the Kremlin. Lagba Omer. 5,000 Jewish kids marching in the Kremlin, screaming, Shema Yisrael, Adinoy Eloheinu, Adinoy Echad, in the center of the regime, which made its focus for 70 years to obliterate every last vestige of God, every last vestige of Judaism, every last vestige of Torah. There was a communist teacher, a communist teacher, who turned to her class and she said to them, do you see the building outdoors? They said, yeah. Do you see your nose? Yeah. Why? Because it exists. Do you see the classroom? Yes. Why? Because it exists. Do you see my eyes? Yes. Why? Because they exist. Do you see the door? Yes. Because it exists. Do you see the floor? Yes, could exist. Do you see God? No. She says, you know why? He doesn't exist. Silence in the room. A Jewish kid gets up and says, friends, comrades, do you see our teacher's nose? Yes, because it exists. Do you see her forehead? Yes, because it exists. Do you see her cheeks? Yes, because Do you see her brains? No. You know why? Because they don't exist. The other day, there was a Russian history teacher in a Chabad school in Ukraine. Okay, listen to this. And she, she was a kami. And she says to the students, what's the most important event of 1799? So one of the boys, Chabad kid, he raises his hand, says, 1799 is the year when Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Liadi was liberated from prison. Teacher went crazy, ballistic. Said, really? That's ridiculous. 1799 is the year when Alexander Pushkin was born. Pushkin was born. The greatest poet in Russian history died from a duel at the age of 36. Boy looked at her and said, Pushkin, so I'm Pushkin. 1800, 1805, 1810. She turns to the class, what's the most important event in Russian history, 1812? The boy says, Pushkin's bar mitzvah. <laughs> When you think about, when you think about what happened in that country, Stalin in the 30 years from 1924 when Lenin died to 1953, March, Purim, when he died, close to 50 million people were killed, Judaism was uprooted, and every normal Jew felt it's the end. And seven decades later, seven decades later, you go back to that place and you see hundreds of shuls, camps, programs, Jewish events. And then you come here tonight and you see that people who left that country, left Uzbekistan and other cup regions of the USSR and came here. And Yiddishkeit is living and breathing and vibrant. I ask you, my dear friends, if this is not a miracle, what is a miracle? <clears throat> and
And thus, fascinating. Uh, this Hanukkah, just a few months ago, the first night of Hanukkah, at the brand, you ever in Berlin, at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, the chief rabbi of Berlin told me, his name is Rabbi Tachtel, the president of Germany called him in and said, this year is the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. How should Germany commemorate it? And the president said, I have an idea. Let's light a menorah by the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. That gate where Hitler gave so many of his speeches, where there were so many Nazi parades. Let's light a menorah there. And he asked the rabbi of Berlin, can I light the menorah? So the rabbi, without skipping a beat, said, Mr. President, not only will you light the menorah, you will light the shamash. <laughs> you will light the candle that lights everything else. You will light the candle, the flame that kindles everyone else. And the first night of Hanukkah and the cherry picker, president of Germany, and a Chabad Hasidic rabbi got up in the cherry picker and in Brandenburg Gate, that famous place where there's so many infamous videos and pictures of Hitler standing there and giving his speeches that you have to eradicate the Jewish vermin. They lit a menorah, a huge menorah right there in the presence of thousands of people. And I thought to myself, what a moment in Jewish history. What a miracle of Jewish history. And a major part of this miracle is Emmet. The work of Emmet to be able to ignite this flame, to be able to maintain this flame, to be able to be the Shamish that lights up so many other candles is an extraordinary experience. It's a privilege to be a part of it in so many different ways, a privilege for me. I think a privilege for you, a privilege for all of us. Right now, right now, Emmet has undertaken the ambition to stand at the forefront of Jewish history, not to allow another chapter of assimilation to take over one of the most glorious Jewish communities in Jewish history. How devastatingly sad would it be if Thousands of years in the East, it didn't happen. But here in America, the land of opportunity, a whole generation of Bukharian youth gets lost to Yiddishkeit. How sad will it be? Sam Levinson was a Jewish comedian. He used to say, my father came to America because they told him that the streets are paved with gold. When he came here, he learned three things. The streets are not paved with gold, number one. Number two, the streets are not paved at all. Number three, he has to pave them. <laughs> but today, as we live here in this land of golden opportunities, and really one of the greatest countries in terms of Jewish life and existence, how sad will it be if a whole generation gets lost? Simply not because they're bad, they're good kids simply because nobody cared enough. And that's why I, for one, on behalf of all of the Jewish people the world over, you ask me, how do I speak on behalf of all the Jews? Every Jew speaks on behalf of all the Jews. It's called chutzpah. <laughs> Rabbi Waiwai is no different. I also have chutzpah. On behalf of all the Jews the world over, all of us, I, we salute Emmet. We salute its work and we salute each and every one of you sitting in this room who have displayed the courage and the commitment and the unwavering love and dedication to be part of this momentous miracle of our chapter in history of a heshev lev avot albanim, of bringing back the hearts of parents through the hearts of children, of igniting soul after soul, one by one with love, with respect, with affection, with dedication. May you have tremendous bracha v'atzlacha in this work. May Hashem dwell in the work of your hands and may you complete this work as all of the Jewish people experience our ultimate redemption speedily. Amen. Thank you very much.
יש אמונה, חזקה מכל הפעם